All right, guys, let's talk about functions and what they do. After all, even though we have all that data, we got to somehow utilize it in order to, well, you know, make a game. Uh, so how does that actually happen? Now, that's a very interesting question. We're going to dive into that answer right away. First of all, I'm going to basically open the same thing that's been open for a while now on my computer. And of course, this is my game mob, game mode example. So we're going to do a lot of stuff here, Let's, well, presumably, of course. And I kind of want to take a look at what our options are. Now, first and foremost, you will notice that game mode example is actually a child of game mode base, which means that because it's a child, it inherits some uh, functions from its base class, which is, of course, game mode base. If we hover over the functions here, you'll see that we have an override drop down button and you can see that all the overridable functions that we can uh, sort of grab, let's say the tick, right? This is uh, this is this runs basically every time the tick has been set up in the class defaults over here. So every ever forever, obviously you can set it up in terms of seconds if you want. Uh, also, you, you don't have to obviously click this and override. Let's just say I'm going to delete this. Notice that my functions went up to 32 again. I'm going to simply right click and write down begin play. There it is. And as you can see, it just pulled one and overridden it. Basically, the begin play will do what I tell it to do in this particular blueprint. Now, whenever we talk about functions, you have to understand that your knowledge with working about working with them is directly mm, correlated to the amount of knowledge that you have about the library available to you in Unreal Engine 4. How does that actually, what, what did I just say? Well, essentially, if you want to perform a, um, a particular action, you need to actually have the function that respond that's responsible for that action. And if you don't know its name, its existence, or really what it does, you're kind of screwed. You're going to have to write your own. I mean, I've written a bunch of functions myself when I started and I realized that they're already done. You know, all I had to do is simply utilize them. So the most basic way of examining the library available to you is simply by right clicking. And as you can see, we've got all the actions for this blueprint. Remember, this is only for this blueprint. Uh, of course, you can turn off the uh, context sensitivity. Of course, as you can see, there's a, a bunch of explanations here. Uh, we can remove that and it's going to increase our available um, functions but basically exposing all of the library that is available to us that doesn't mean that you should always you know utilize concept context sensitive stuff you can actually set up a bunch of targets when it comes to things such as maybe i want to use only components maybe this blueprint etc but let's just leave this on for now and generally speaking whenever you drag something off you will have the appropriate functions available to you Sometimes, of course, you might want to turn this off whenever you know that the function, whenever you essentially know the function you need uh, and what it does and how to use it. Okay, uh, now at this point, you might be thinking, Jesus Christ, now if I need an audio function, I'm going to have to drop down here and just take a look at oh, Jesus subtitles and then, oh, oh my God, effects. Holy crap. Oh, commanded reality. I don't even know what that is, by the way. Uh, get tracking quality. What the hell is that? Now, notice that all of these functions have a little tooltip. This will, this will help you understand what it's about to be, uh, you know, what's it for. However, it, it, clearly it says if something is replicated or not. However, there is a little bit of a problem with this. The documentation on, on Unreal Engine 4 is kind of finicky when it comes to functions. I mean, there are some functions that I know I search for them and then the documentation, I just get like one sentence explaining what it does. Uh, and sometimes that's just not enough for you to understand what it does. So sometimes you might have to experiment with a particular function to see what the hell is it supposed to be doing. Now, whenever you need something, generally, when you don't know if it exists or not, you're going to have to try to use your search. That's how I started learning about the library anyway. I was just searching about a bunch of different stuff. Now, for example, if I wanted to print something on the screen, let's just say I wanted to um, show a text, some string or something, right? Uh, I would just type, let's just say, well, what's going to happen if I type text? Ooh, that's a lot of text. And as you can see, a lot of them are two text. They essentially transform whatever it is you put into them into text. You can even um, hover all of them, over them and you'll see converts a linear color value to localized formatted text in the form of RGBA. Um, of course, there's a bunch of different two texts and you can see print text. Another way, of course, would be to simply write down print 
and as you can see, print string. Now there's a difference between string and text because if you remember from last video, we do have different types of um, variables. Of course, there's a variable of type spring, a string and a variable of type text. Now let's just say I select this here you will notice that it's for development only, means this, this little bit here only says that this will be executed and relevant only during development time. It actually is not gonna sprint, uh, you know, print anything whenever you, you know, a, sort of a, a package your game. And you can actually even see here, as you can see, this node will only be executed in the editor and the development builds in a packaged game. Uh, it will obviously be treated as disabled whenever you ship or test builds or whatever. Whenever you cook your game, this will not work, okay? But the reason you use this uh, in the develop during development is to simply check, well, fast, a very quick and easy way to check if execution is running through it or uh, just for report, right? Uh, let's just say uh, you shoot an arrow or you shoot something and you have to be, you want to be sure that it died. And the, fast, the fastest way to, to see if it died is by having a print string saying, hey, whatever you shot just died. Uh, the reason you would do that is because a lot of times you'll be prototyping before you actually have animations and all that jazz and uh you know you just have boxes and squares and whatever <laughs> crap right all sorts of representations of what's supposed to be placeholders you'll simply be working on the logic and you need to know if your logic is successful because you're not going to have a death animation you're not really going to know if whatever you shot actually died so this is a very fast and easy way of um you know grabbing functions now that being said i'm going to delete this because i kind of want to uh touch on this a little bit later. The idea of functions is that you have a library, but that doesn't mean that that's all that's available to you. You can write your own functions. In fact, if you, do, if you right click here, you create a go to blueprints, you can create your own function library if you so desire. Now the function library, basically anything you write here will be available to you project wide without actually grabbing anything. It's simply a function and you define it here. Uh, but I'm not going to go over that just yet. Uh, I simply want to talk about the events because this is where it all begins, okay? Event begin play is something that is basically standard. Now, you also have a construction script here, and the difference between the construction script and the begin play, uh, begin play, by the way, runs whenever the object is created, okay? If you have an orc and on begin play it does a fart, it will only fart whenever it is actually created. In other words, when it's spawned, right? It doesn't mean that it's going to fart the minute the game begins, right? The, mo the moment the player launches the game, all the orcs fart, right? That's not how it works. Now, the construction script script is fairly similar in the begin to the begin play in that it actually does whatever it is you want to do whenever the object is constructed, okay? Um, the cool thing is I believe it's possible to delay the begin play. I'm pretty sure is it possible to delay I think it's possible to delay the begin place. Uh, maybe not. Maybe not. I'm not too sure about this bit here. But um, the point is that you want to be using construction script to do stuff in the engine itself, all right? For example, here. And the cool bit about the uh, construction script is that it can uh, operate whenever you update anything in the viewport. So you can sort of like randomize your placements if you have trees, right, etc. You'd be want you want to be using the construction script to sort of uh, help you construct the level. Of course, it still fires, I believe, during gameplay. Does it fire? Yes, I believe it fires during gameplay whenever you create the object. Or does it? That's that's a, that's a topic you're gonna have to research yourself. See, I'm thinking about the constructor, and that's that's a programming constructor. Whereas this is a construction script, which actually I, I think it doesn't. It script to play spawn components and do the setup. Okay, it doesn't actually explain it. There's a bit here. You don't know, there's no tooltip saying if it runs, um, you know, if it's available on the final pro uh, product, like uh, on the shipped uh, game. So anyway, whatever logic you want to be performing, 100% I can tell you it works in the engine. Whatever you write down here, it is going to work in the engine, but only when you play. This is the runtime logic. This is your in-editor logic, right? Just think of it this way. Easiest with the easiest thing to visualize. Now, when it comes to events, what is exactly an event? Well, it's something that happens and it sends an execution line. Now here, for example, if I drag something off, you can see this wire is my main execution line. I can do whatever. Maybe I just let, uh, you know, release my mouse button and say print string. And my main is execution line 
on event uh, event begin play is gonna you know basically fire a pulse from the begin play to the function will we'll call it essentially and execute this function. So whatever I write here in string, it could say hello. In fact, if I compile this and you know just play this right now, it's gonna say hello at the top left. Unfortunately, it's not gonna keep it there for long because of course the duration is only two seconds. Again, we're not gonna use this just yet. I simply wanted to give an example, an illustration, so to speak. Now, let's go over to the left side here and really dig into this. First of all, uh, you have obviously two types of events, uh, many types of uh, overridable functions, but you could also make your own. And that is the really cool bit. You also can make macros. You can even make your own events. As you can see here, we have an event begin play. Let's create a custom event, custom event. Now a custom event is just say, well, custom. A custom event, unlike this event here, requires a call. Now this is going to fire off the moment the game begins because it's being called the moment the game begins. So does the event tick, right? These two events will be firing off whenever the, you know, the appropriate conditions are met. This one, however, needs to be called because, well, it doesn't have anything connected behind it, right? It needs a condition to fire off. So if I go ahead and grab this and do the same thing with print string, Ah, uh, crying out loud. There we go. Um, if I do the same thing and I play now, I'm just compile this thing and then play. Well, there's nothing really happening here because let's play again so that you don't think I, I'm lying to you. Nothing is happening because really nothing is hitting that thing. Nothing is prompting it to uh, execute. That For that reason, we're gonna have to have to call it. So I'm gonna say, all right, and I'm gonna say custom. And currently, as you can see, call function, right? Function, as you can see, instigating, instigating other events. So events are kind of functions. And I'm gonna say call custom, and there it is. It also has a target. So basically, whenever you're calling something, you need to say what's gonna, what's the thing that's gonna be executing it, all right? Currently, the target itself is just fine because, well, it's inside this blueprint. If it was outside a blueprint, we would have to perform some, you know, voodoo magic. We're going to talk about this in the next video when we talk about uh, blueprint communication. But for now, just think of it as long as itself, that means that whatever this event will be executed on top of this particular object. In other words, the game mode, which always exists, right? Now, the cool thing about uh, events is, of course, you could, uh, let's say, add a, a bunch of extra um, logic here, right? Whatever you want to do. And then you could say, well, you know what? I simply want to collapse this to a function. Um, which is not a, not a really good idea, but whatever. Um, and or you could collapse it to a, a macro or you collapse it to nodes. Essentially, you can collapse them into this one little thing which does not have anything. So I'm just gonna say my custom printer, right? It, it's basically like creating another graph. So double click this, you have another graph. Um, obviously you have the option of creating an extra event graph. However, it'll be kind of detached. So if we create another event graph, it will be, of course, Actually, it won't be detached. That's that's pretty cool. It's still part of the uh, child. No, it's not. It's not. It's not. So it has its own sort of logic. Okay. Uh, but, you know, for whatever it is you're trying to do, uh, I'm just going to delete this. For whatever it is you're trying to do, you might have a particular, uh, you know, uh, setup. So as you can see here, we have no inputs, no outputs, because this does not take any inputs and outputs. In fact, this is kind of uh, lame, right? But if I play this now, we should have our hello here. As you can see, it's over there, so it works just fine. Uh, I'm going to delete this, though, because I really don't need it, and currently we just have a custom function, which is unknown, uh, because we don't have it defined. Now, another thing about events, notice that when I click on begin play, nothing happens, but if I go ahead and create another custom event, I can actually define some inputs, right? Some inputs. Inputs are essentially data that you pass, parameters that you pass, to whatever is about to use them. So let's just say, in my case, I wanna be printing text, right? So I'm gonna create a variable, uh, an input called input text, or text to print, right? That's my variable. Uh, generally speaking, you don't wanna be doing that, by the way, you kind of wanna have it at the same place. So if you, in general, you'd be something like this, to print. Right. This will, uh, you know, that's how you type stuff usually, and then it'll automatically correct it for you here. So uh, my custom event zero, I should probably rename this to text printer, and I should let's just say print string again, 
Now, the difference between the previous example and this example, I probably shouldn't have deleted it, it would have been much faster, is I can actually grab this and pass it into the string and pass it into the input here. And whatever I write next time will actually be used. So let's just go ahead and say uh, text printer. I'm calling it right now and I could write down whatever it is I want. So text to print and I'm going to say uh, I just printed this text like a boss. Okay, compile and play the game. I just printed this text. Ah, uh, come on. Okay, uh, I'm gonna just, seriously, that's just ridiculous. Go for 20, 2000, that's gonna stay there for long, for a long, long time. Uh, play, I just printed some text, this text like a boss. So, uh, that's how calling works inside uh, a blueprint and that's how execution lines operate. You have an execution uh, line going into whatever it is you're working in here. Of course, this is not a main execution line, although it kind of turns into it once you call it because you could grab it, grab something from here, call another event, and just keep going and keep going and keep going, which is, of course, pretty cool. Um, the difference between events, though, and macros, we're going kind of backwards here, probably should have started with functions, but let's create a, let's create a new macro. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and create a new macro. So currently, as you can see, this macro has inputs and outputs, notice and outputs. And if I go ahead and create this, it could have a type of input as an executable and a type of output as an executable. So it is already kind of becoming a function. However, let's create a function as well so we can compare this side by side. Um, let's create a new function. Oops. Uh, let's create a new function. Call this... Yeah, I don't know. Uh, texter. Oh, actually, let's call this, let's say that this is a mm, doubler. This will double, right? This will, whatever, whatever it is you, whatever we pass into it will double the value. So let's just say we're going to use an input of an integer or a float, right? And I'm going to say value to double. And here I'm going to say it's going to output my double value. Okay, both are floats. Uh, currently, of course, we don't have, we could output something that we could hard code it, but in general, we would want to do something else. Notice, however, that we only have one execution pin. We cannot have more than one. Here, easy peasy lemon squeezy. Execution, 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 execution. You can have th thousands of executions here and a bunch of them here. And uh, obviously you could have, uh, let's just say maybe it's going to intake something like an integer and it's going to output something like, uh, like uh, I don't know, a vector or whatever, right? Uh, so you've got all these things and then you can hook this up, right? You grab one of these, you can put it, route it through something, then you can route it to the output here and then route this from this from something, route it to the input here. So this kind of is, uh, you know, your macro, this is the power of the macro, allows you to create stuff that is a lot more complex. You sh the difference though, is that macros cannot be called outside of this blueprint. No matter what you do, the this macro is gonna stay available only inside this blueprint. So if I drag this over here, new macro, as you can see, we got a bunch of stuff, but we have an input and we have an output and we have all of these outputs. What's it used for? Generally speaking, it's used to tidy up your code. Now, because just because you can collapse nodes into something um, doesn't mean that it's the best situation because collapsing nodes only means that you get to just simply tidy the place up, whereas a macro allows you to reuse the same logic several different times in the same blueprint, okay? So if I go ahead and create a macro from this, let's say collapse to macro, it'll fail collapsing because it just doesn't take any inputs. It needs something as well in the middle. All right. Uh, so you cannot, you can't even collapse this to a function. Oh, actually you can believe, believe that. Where to go? Oh, there we go. Text printer. So it needs something to trigger it again. So we could have this over here and just say like that. So we're going to print this twice now. Okay. Obviously it needs a text to print because if we double click this. It actually takes an input of text to print. So if I say, if I call this twice, and I'm just going to say this is a huge pain in tech nose, that's a surprise, isn't it? 
And in this case, it's going to, I'm going to get an error because there is no function called text printer anymore. All right. There is a function called text printer one. And inside the text printer one, you have like, essentially I transformed the event into a text printer. Okay. So, uh, that kind of is what I did. I'm going to, of course, um, uh, undo that because I kind of want to keep this uh, a little bit more polished, so to speak. So this is what you'd be using your macros for. This is what you'd be using your events for. Uh, we're, we're not going to talk about event dispatchers just yet. We're going to talk about it in the next video when we talk about a blueprint communication. However, the most important bit here is our doubler. Now this macro, you know, nobody cares about it. You, you might as well could delete it. The doubler on the other hand is a function and the moment you use this, you create this function, you, you get to decide if you want it to be usable only inside this blueprint or outside this blueprint or be overridable by inherited people, such as in this case, we got 31 overridable functions. So it is pretty cool that you the functions a lot more well, functional than uh, macros or events. Uh, and but but they need to have some kind of an output. All right. Uh, I mean, you could have no outputs, but it kind of defeats the purpose of a function. So I'm going to just undo that. And the cool bit, by the way, here is that we need to define some local variables. Well, we don't need in this case, but generally speaking, you would. Uh, so let's just say, actually, in this case, we would. Um, the difference between macros and local and functions is, again, local variables. I cannot create a local variable here. I only can manipulate the data inside it somehow. Whereas a doubler not only can be called everywhere on, you know, as long as it's available to be called, I can also also create a local variable and it's going to be of type integer and it's going to be called um, multiplier. Now, of course, this is kind of overkill. You don't really need that. Um, and of course, I'm kind of hard coding this in. And generally speaking, local variables are not accessible in the event graph, unless, of course, I grab something from the doubler and I have my multiplier here, uh, you know, completely output. Uh, this is a conversion uh, here, but I could output my multiplier and this will kind of give me what I'm looking at. But of course, that's not what I want to do. The point is that I could only get this if I use my doubler. Um, here. That's how I could get the local variable. But if you're going to output it, it kind of removes the whole purpose of local variables if you cannot actually do something about it. So the idea here is uh, for this particular function, because it's a doubler, we're going to grab a value, which is, I don't know, whatever value it's going to be. And we're going to do some operations with it. In other words, we're going to multiply it. And we're going to multiply a float by float. In this case, actually, we need a float by int but there is no such thing. So we're gonna mu multiply a float by float. Uh, I'm gonna grab this and simply transform it into a float, essentially round it up. And we're simply multiplying stuff. I believe M was, no, multigate was M. I'm gonna talk about uh, flow control in the video after that. Uh, I think there was a shortcut for multiplying. Was it three, one, two, five, no? Okay, um, never mind that. So we can add different output, uh, many outputs, by the way, here. And basically, it can multiply a bunch of these um, things here. Of course, you can delete them as well. Um, so you can multiply quite a lot of values at the same time. But for now, we're just going to say we're going to multiply these two. And I'm going to give the output over here. I can essentially uh, drag this over here. And this is my function done. It will double anything I want. Of course, assuming I assign a value of two to my multiplier, meaning that whatever I pass here will be outputted over there. Now, here's an interesting bit about functions. They can be dirty or pure. Let's, uh, let me just give you an idea here. So we got our text printer here, and let's just say we're gonna grab another custom event, right, custom event, and this custom event will be my calculator, all right? So let's just say currently I have my uh, calculator. I'm going to say from here on, I want to use my doubler. And it needs, of course, again, notice it's got a target, but it also has a value to double. And I need something to double set value, right? So I'm going to go ahead and create a variable. It will be of type float. Oops. Uh, um, my value. So I don't know, just that. Uh, uh, unknown. No, uh, I don't know what I call it. Just value. Okay, uh, we've got our float. It's gonna be of type float, of course. It doesn't have to be, but you know, 
whatever, of type float. And of course, we will use it for uh, calculation. Currently, it's not compiled, so it has to be compiled. Currently, it's got a value of 50. And the reason, by the way, if I expose this like this, if I, if I don't expose it right now, if I click on class defaults, I'm not going to have anything here. But if I expose it, it should be and compiled. It should be somewhere over here. And there it is. As you can see, we got a default value of 50. So on the class defaults, you can actually, um, you know, change this value. Unfortunately, let's just say I'm going to save this. Unfortunately, if I click here, I'm really not going to get anything. I'm going to have to double click this and then modify this, which is the unfortunate bit. I kind of like the idea. That's what. I, that's the only thing I miss in Unity. You click on something and you get its class defaults in the details already, which is, you know, it's just faster. Um, but the cool bit is that if you if you drag this object here, for example, you'll have that in the details pane. Of course, uh, there's no point dragging anything here because it'll just run. Uh, uh, kind of uh, kind of defeats the purpose, of course, of um, having a um, game mode. But if I did this, for example, in the actor or in a character or in a pawn, I would actually um, be able to modify this uh, much later. Okay. So the next thing we need to do is grab this value over here and get it. Of course, should have used control probably. Get this value and plug it into the value to double. And then let's just say that we want to text some stuff. So in this case, I'm going to say instead of text printer, I'm going to delete this for now. And I'm going to simply print a text called uh, print string. And I'm going to say I'm smart. I'm very smart. I'm going to keep this to 15 seconds. I'm going to make this look green. And now whenever I print something here, it's going to be, let's just say another 15 seconds, it's going to be red. Okay. Very simple for now. So I've got my values here. Everything is looking good. I need to output my value. Now what I want to do is print my uh, the result of whatever it is I'm passing through. So what I'm going to do, grab uh, call text printer. Obviously, in this case, there really isn't much of a difference because there's nothing happening in between. But as you can see, I've got a text to print. I'm going to be passing my return value. So in this case, it will be like that. It will turn my, uh, my float into text. And now we'll pass this over here in my string. Um, however, if you take a look here, there really is no point. Why didn't I call print string? What is the benefit of having a function if you're not going to do something with the data passed in between? So what I'm going to do is simply, I'm going to hold control and break this off. Alt. There we go. And I'm going to create a another variable. Let's, get, let's create, actually let's create, let's just create a append string append. So I'm going to use an append string. I've got two strings as you can see right now. I'm going to use the text to print as an A. Um, actually, I'm going to use text to print as a B because this is the thing that gets appended. I'm going to click Alt here, return the value in my string here, and I will simply promote this to a variable. And it's going to be called um, explanation. <clears throat> okay. Um, now what we printed here was I'm smart, right? So this is the first thing that's going to get printed. Um, and then we need to call our text printer. Actually, we need to call our uh, calculator, my bad. Okay. Uh, we're calling our calculator. So, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go over this real quick after we're done. And the explanation here, we will compile just to get the editing bit. And I'm going to say that because because the double, well, I'm just getting a bit rid ridiculous, but the double of whatever. So we kind of have to actually, <laughs> this is going to be quite ridiculous now. Uh, I'm going to close this. So the double of whatever string. So we need to grab this value again and append it. So I'm going to grab the value. And this should be, by the way, of course, public. I'll grab these two. And the explanation currently is I'm smart because I'm going to create another append. By the way, there's other operations with the string, by the way. If we take a look here in my, well, there is no other way. I think there was something string. 
Um, is there possible to add extra strings? No, that's gonna be a real pain in the ass. Oh yeah, you can build a string. That's pretty cool. You can create a new string. So, um, well, we don't really need to build a string. We need to build. Okay, uh, let's just build a string from this. And as you can see, we probably should have used this bit where we get to you know prefix, append to, and then suffix. But uh, that's I'm not going to do that right now. I'm just going to use the very basic mode so that we uh, you know you, you you can follow me here. So essentially, here in the value, I'm going to say two string. There we go. Two string. I will append this again. Didn't have to do this, of course. It would have been um, converted on its own. Append. I'm going to append my explanation, which is the first one. So in this case, it would be because the double of what? Because the double of whatever value we're passing through here is, here I'm going to append again, uh, to A, I'm going to say is, and here I'm going to append this over here. Okay, so Whatever I'm saying is, whatever, right? Uh, as you can see currently, we're calling the text printer. Everything seems like it's in order. I believe there is nothing wrong. The very beginning play, gonna print string, I'm smart, calculator, blah, 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 blah. Compile, and let's play, see what happens, play. It says, I'm smart at begin play. And then it says, because the double of 50 is 100. And of course, it's gonna operate really on anything. Um, of course, in class details here, we could say that we want a value of, oh, I don't know, go calculate that. Uh, this may be a little bit too ridiculous. So let's just say 2569, something like this, something like this. So I'm going to compile this and play, and let's see the result. The double of this is this, okay? Uh, fairly uh, self-explanatory here. However, of course, we need spaces, etc. So perhaps I need to add a space bar here and a space bar here. And perhaps I need to add a, an explanation here, my space bar as well. Right, I compile and now we get to play because the double of two points and blah, blah, blah is this, this, this. Right, so what exactly is happening? Well, in order to figure out how your execution follows, we kind of need to debug because currently we can't really see much. All right, so what I'm going to do is play in, currently I'm simulating, of course, but I'm going to play a standalone game or just select a viewport. I believe it's going to pop it off. Yep. Um, so what we're going to do is insert some breakpoints. In other words, we want to really see what's going on here. No debug object select because we don't really, we're not really debugging anything right now. Uh, but if we were to do that, I believe we should start, of course, with the print string. So I'm going to add a breakpoint here. You can double, you can right click and add a breakpoint, uh, or you could just F9 by default. Then uh, print string, then we're going to call calculate and calculator. The calculator is going to be called. We're going to double something. I'm going to break it here again. I'm going to call text printer. And as the text printer is called, we will see what's going to happen with print string. So we got nine breakers over here. And uh, once I hit play, as you can see, the game is paused. There's really nothing over here on this side because we're just calling it. We're just saying, look, I want you to print the string. So if we take a look here, uh, I, want, I will step next, right? The F10 basically, boom. Now we've printed, it should be popping up here. Perhaps I kind of paused too soon. Then next here, I believe it's still not here. Uh, another one, this is the next step. This is our break point here. And uh, another one, we're just going to go to the doubler. We go next step, next step, next step, next step. We could skip some frames. Skip some frames. As you can see, we currently, we can now resume. Okay. Uh, but if we play this again, um, kind of ridiculous. Um, essentially, we're going to double this. We're going to use the doubler uh, um, function here. It's going to go here. It's going to go here. It's going to go into the we'll call text printer. The text printer is going to do whatever it is it's going to do and print the text while appending all these things together. It's going to run this and this will run all of these. And that's the final result. Okay. Uh, I'm going to press control F9 uh, just to get rid of all these breakpoints. Uh, I think by default it's control shift F9 for some reason, but whatever. Um, now, the cool thing is about this is that it doesn't have to need an executable pin. So the doubler, for example, it's not necessarily a good idea because why would you need the execution on it? 
it should be a pure function. So if I go ahead and click here and just say pure and compile this, it should change the way we're operating. As you can see, my doubler now does not have, it's, it's, it's green instead of blue, right? All of these functions, as you can see, these are green and these are blue, right? This is blue, green. This is an event, of course, we, the one we, we, that, that we created. Uh, blue, debug, visual logger, whatever, blue, right? All these blue ones, they require execution pins. So they do uh, sort of, you can change, you can change the execution flow. Whereas uh, pure functions, instead of like, unlike dirty functions, actually get ran without any execution required. So it might clean up things better than, for example, a doubler is not really required to be executed. Also, you can set up its outputs and inputs. And of course, uh, you, you can edit it here in the multiplier. However, notice that because it's local, I nothing. there's nothing I can do to really change the default value here. Nothing, I, I can't really expose this in any way. Like there's literally nothing I can do. So uh, whenever you're creating functions, make sure that they're kind of self-contained, that you don't need to go inside here and change, oh, I need to double this. So instead of a multiplier here, this would prob this probably should have been promoted to, you know, um, you know, to a uh, just a regular variable outside or to just a regular input. Uh, but, uh, you know, whatever, whatever floats your boat. So as you can see, there's quite a difference between the three, despite them kind of operating in the same fashion. I, I could create a, I could sort of modify this macro, but I really can't be bothered with this here. Um, the point is that it's just, everything is a type of execution and you really should think about functions, macros, and events as ways for you to modify data, right? You get, you, you call something and tell it, hey man, I wanna grab a string, I wanna grab a value, I'm gonna do whatever. Uh, and, uh, you know, you have to do what I tell you. Obviously, again, it, it entirely lies down, you know, it, it basically comes down to how well you understand the library. All of these things are available to you. Now, again, if you don't know what you want, <clears throat> there's two ways, again. Uh, you could simply grab something off and just say, right, well, let's see what I've got available just on these, you know, just executable actions. As you can see, these are executable actions. If I grab something off here, these are action providing a string because you need a string provided, okay? Uh, these are actions who are taking a string, okay? As you can see, whenever I grab something here, I take a string. A value, same thing, actions taking a float. Um, again, sometimes you might need uh, to turn a float into a string, so right. If you, let's say, let's say I want some string, so I need to write down string here, and as you can see, I can only do a few things. So print string, for example, it's gonna automatically uh, you know, combine it here, but it's going to take the duration instead of grabbing and doing this here. So as you can see, it really depends on how you know, how well you know the library. And you simply, you'll simply get it as time goes. Again, the other way to do it is just simply right click and just search for whatever it is you're looking for. Maybe you're looking for destroy object. How do I destroy an object? Oh, the more I type, as you can see, we've got loads of destroyed. Event destroyed, which is an event whenever an object is destroyed. Or maybe I want to destroy the session. Or maybe I want to destroy the actor. Which actor do I have to destroy? Self, probably. Maybe I should destroy another actor, right? What kind of destructions do I want? Whenever I run this, event destroy will be called. Right? Because event destroyed is called whenever an actor is destroyed. So I can destroy myself, which is, a, by the way, idiotic right now because I'm in the game mode. Uh, but whenever I'm destroyed, I'm going to say, well, and I want to do something and maybe I could create myself, maybe spawn another game mode. I wonder if it's possible. Yeah, well, spawn actor. Spawn actor from class. I believe it might be possible to select game mode. <laughs> yeah, so currently what I just did is, I don't think it's going to work, but uh, I'm going to destroy my game mode and, you know, before it's destroyed, I'm going to spawn another <laughs> spawn another game mode right i'm gonna spawn it somewhere in the world uh i don't i think this might just crash let's just compile oh there we go it's gonna give me no 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 yeah you need an instigator i believe in this case must have an input wired yeah you need a you need an input for the transform but then again the transform is like this is a world object so it doesn't matter look the point is that you've got loads of different options and the idea by the by the end of your sort of creation you need to have a very coherent very readable graph now, one way, of course, would be to collapse this kind of stuff. So you could grab this and simply collapse nodes. Um, this could be, for example, a macro, although in this case, it's kind of pointless because we really don't have anything. But if this was not a pure function, let me just impurify this, make it dirty. 
And let's just say I'm going to use my executable here like this. I could simply say, all right, well, you know, that's the case. Uh, I can't, and let's just say for some reason that this is hooked up to, uh, I don't know, do, do something like that. Come on. Yeah, you can absolutely, by the way, hook several execution pins into the same thing. Uh, that's not a problem. So I'm going to grab these and I'm going to co collapse this to a macro. And you can see that I currently have a macro that takes the value of a double and does whatever it is requires to do. Of course, same thing happens if I collapse nodes. Still, it's going to have it's just a graph that has all these things. And the, the last bit is, of course, if I collapse it to a function, this is going to create a new function. It's going to kind of delete the rest of these things. Double click it. As you can see, we've still got a doubler and a text printer. And then that's the output. There is no output because this function does not need an output. Um, again, you could have a function with an output. And you can simply write everything that you ever wanted in the event graph. And then when you clean it up, cleaning it up to simply, uh, uh, you know, simply wrap stuff just to get rid of it. Again, another option would be to um, comment, which is also a good idea. Just uh, I'll select something, like in this case here, and comment. And uh, this is going to be, um, I don't know, um, append. So what this does is going to append the incoming text to the calculation result and and print it. For example, something like that, right? Um, and you could change, even change the color of your thingy. So something like this, for example. And again, uh, the cool thing is you can move it around. And of course, as you zoom out, you can actually see what it does. So uh, pen incoming text. Okay, that's what I'm looking for. Maybe I need to actually go ahead and take a look at this text. So at the moment you comment something, you're kind of designating that area as you know the thing that's responsible for it. Um, so it, it's 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 pretty interesting because it, it allows you to sort of um, well, how should I say it? Uh, it allows you to organize your event graph, and it's very important because as your game grows, like remember this is the game mode. That stuff is gonna have a lot of things. Like it's gonna be a huge graph. Uh, the bigger the game is, and if you're managing, of course, your um, if you're managing your data por uh, appropriately and you're not going to have quite a lot of that many variables and you're not going to have you know data leaks or data loss whenever an object gets destroyed because again if you have if you had for example this value on a uh, well, well we'll we'll do it. we'll do this when we talk about communication but uh, generally speaking that's pretty much actually it these are the differences between functions macros and events um, event dispatchers we're going to use in the next video as well all right, so compile this stuff and just simply save. And uh, that's it, guys. I'll see you next time when we talk about Blueprint Communication. And I believe it's going to be all second to last video. Okay? All right. So, bye-bye. Uh,